Um, I'd like to circle back to the topic of at-risk students, um, and I'd like to start with uh, Shilu if you want to talk a little bit about that with uh, the college realm, and then we can go into K through 12 as well. We are looking closely at Wichita State at students who are at risk um, because it's a retention issue. You know, we recruit the students. Uh, they obviously qualify to um, gain admission to the university and then, um, for whatever reason, um, fail to progress. And so now we have um, lots of support systems now that have been put in place um, both at the academic level, um, at the social level through student invo involvement programs, um, student success initiatives um, that where s both the instructors, the professors, um, get involved directly with the students in terms of what is causing the lack of progress, um, tutoring programs, individualized, um, what we call supplemental instruction for classes that have um, high failure rates. Um, because if a student isn't prepared and then gets to you know, the collegiate level and um, is really struggling, then we want to provide support networks to help them be successful. So we've added a lot of programming. Um, even within the last couple of years and continue to add even more programming to help students be more successful because in the end it's an also an impact we can talk about student loans um, if students are at risk they fail out of college that loan repayment begins and now they don't have any type of job to then begin um, repaying that um, so that investment through loans or whatever um, other um, your own uh, program, your own costs uh, that you spend for college education, you're um, really doing that with the motivation for better paying jobs. Um, and if you fail out, then, you know, that that right there is what um, leads to default on student loans. And so it's a, it's a circle. And we are trying more and more because that impacts our default rate when students um, don't progress and graduate. Um, and so we want to retain those students, help them be successful in the classroom, um, help them be successful just on campus in general. And so added lots of programming for that. And in what ways are you guys working to support at-risk students? Is there anything coming down the, down the pike? Well, I th I, you know, it's what we're constantly trying to do. When uh, three out of four students in our district are, are coming from homes of poverty, that, that creates risk right there. When students aren't uh, um, outside of school, aren't sure where their next meal is coming from, whether there's, there's heat, uh, safety, and just basic mobility. I mean, we've got some elementary schools that... The students that start the beginning of the year, there will only be 20% of those that started will be in the same same school at the end of the school year. So part of what we've tried to do is build that system of supports. One of those things is, is being a school system so that as students move from school to school, we're able to pick them up where they had, had been um, in their previous school and carry them forward. So really looking at those systemic reforms that we need to from an academic standpoint. The wraparound services trying to work, though those continue to diminish with, uh, with the community and, and volunteer groups, because if you can't be, meet the basic needs of those students and their families, their ability to, um, to progress in school is difficult. Uh, Grace Med has been a wonderful partner, and we have a number of clinics that uh, um, are on school district property that we've done in, in partnership. They've raised the funds for them, and, and we provide uh, some of that property because if a student's sitting in class and they've got a toothache or they're, they're ill, and particularly students coming out of homes of poverty, um, you know, it may be days before they even have the opportunity to see a doctor if they will at all. So by then, now they're missing a week or more of school to what could have been something that could have been taken care of um, earlier on. And those are just some of the challenges uh, that, that our students face that you, you may not face in, in, uh, in other areas. So it's, it's really providing um, and working with uh, the community as a whole to see if we can, we can support them, not just in school and academically, but what can we do to, uh, um, to try to help their needs be met outside of school, which we know has such an incredible impact on how they'll be able to, uh, to function and, and perform and learn when they're 
um, at school when we do have them. I, I, I would just comment on the, the funding side of, of at risk because if you've paid attention and, and, and heard legislators talk about our old school finance formula, they had a lot of complaints about the at risk funding, uh, which was based on uh, on poverty of a student, and and they didn't believe that was uh, legitimate, or they thought we were making up the numbers or cooking the books, uh, which isn't true at all. Um, and case in point, uh, one fall the legislators asked for uh, information about a uh, comparison between the number of students that we claimed as free and reduced as part of the, the federal child nutrition guidelines in comparison to the number of students we serve that we determined academically were at risk. Surprisingly enough, uh, we, got to cl we claimed about 33,000 students at, in that year that met the po federal poverty guidelines. But we were serving 35,000 students that we had academically determined were at risk. So the fact that we're actually, we were actually weren't getting enough funding for the at-risk students that we could identify. So uh, whatever mechanism we use, uh, I think we have to, to make sure that we are trying to address the student needs from whatever kind of funding formula there is. So uh, I think every school district in the state now tracks a lot of factors that, that, that we can actually put data on the, on the table that, that shows these students are at risk for these particular reasons. So if we can ever get to a point where there's a funding formula that starts to provide funding for the additional needs that we have for those students, then, then we'll be a lot further down the road. Thank you. Um, Shilu, what is the future for school finance if there's some kind of an innovation or something coming that might kind of transform that? Um, you know, you're talking about financial aid. Right. Um, so some of the things that are coming um, down as far as, you know, I talked about the FAFSA and um, the increase in funding is really what we need, um, both at the state level. Um, when we were talking earlier about the increase um, in costs of, um, at, of higher education in general and how much it costs for students to go to school, you have to think about all the resources. We talk about um, students at risk. Okay, that's programming that has to be added. Um, when we see state funding decrease year after year, and we look at, okay, the additional resources we have to provide to students, the additional um, technology needs that students have. Um, we want to be competitive. We want to retain those students um, in locally in Wichita. We want to keep them from going um, out of state for our school. And so that means we have to add things um, value at Wichita State. And so we're doing that with some of the things that the initiatives we have going with Innovation Campus and some of the other initiatives. Well, that is um, private partnerships that we are doing because the state funding is not enough. And so um, in terms of the future, yes, the, f the federal formula, um, that of course, we hope for increases there, continued funding, um, expansion of programs. Um, there has been some programs that have been expanded, and we, we hope to see more um, really in the grant funding area, but you know, a lot of what's been happening has been in the loan area, so we would like to see that change, of course. But at the state level, um, additional resources in terms of scholarships. There are current programs that exist for high need areas like nursing, teaching, and we'd like to see some of that expand um, into grant programs. Um, we would love to offer um, additional scholarship dollars, um, but again, where does that funding come from? And so our foundation has a new campaign, um, and one of the primary focuses is scholarships for students. Um, and we have emphasized that um, need-based scholarships now has to be a priority. Um, obviously, because we as an institution are seeing more first-generation students, um, and we have an expansive merit program, but we'd like to add need programs because those students that come in as first-generation students, um, there is that need component, low-income students who um, could utilize additional funding. Um, at least at our level, it is the for local students, um, 
the value in terms of the costs. So you're talking about um, an education for a public school, tuition and fees compared to private schools, um, comparison to community colleges. Students have to look and be really informed consumers in terms of um, comparing those costs. Um, and so we do our part in terms of trying to get that information out to students earlier. Um, that's one of the upcoming things that I forgot to mention is um, with new legislation um, in the upcoming year, not this next academic year, but the following, is the use of the prior prior year tax return. So right now, students are having to, well, they always obviously think that they have to wait until they file their tax return to file the FAFSA. And so they're not really making decisions about where they're attending until April, May, oftentimes in the summertime. And we want students to be able to do these applications earlier. And so the FAFSA then for the, the following year, you can actually use the 2015 return, which everybody would have already had completed. So um, then the goal is to have that available October 1 of this upcoming year for those high school seniors. And so um, we're working hard. That's a progress, we think. The financial aid community has advocated for that for a long time because there, the research and the data shows that there hasn't been that much of a change in terms of income from somebody who files last year compared to the previous year. And so to be able to use that prior, prior year's tax return isn't a huge impact. And so we can really then go out and tell the students what a financial aid package is and be able to, again, give them information to make an informed decision. Uh, maybe the rest of you can speak to this question. Um, what is the root challenge behind crafting effective assessments? So a lot of discussion about whether assessments are effective or not. I, now I know why I'm sitting in front of the dartboard. You know, <laughs> uh, it, you know the question around uh, around assessments, and there there are a number of different ways you have to look at assessments. Uh, it, you know, you you can think of those um, end of learning type assessments, which we traditionally ACT, SAT, the state assessment. State assessment is given on a specific day at a specific time. Um, then you have assessments that uh, you would want to use to to be able to determine where a student is and then uh, assessments that would allow you to follow that student throughout the year so that you can make instructional decisions at um, at those given points instead of waiting to the end of the year and suddenly turning around the next year and going oh wow now I uh, I've got an idea so for for schools we're held accountable for the snapshot on one day. But for us, what we're trying to focus on are assessments that'll, that allow us to um, determine where a student is and then to progress monitor them as they move through. Those are the most effective because as we can see then what interventions and things were um, uh, working with the student, are they being successful or not? If we are, great, we, we can continue to look at that. If not, then we need to make those changes. And waiting for end of the year and the next year's teacher taking taking a look at that. So it's, uh, um, it's not easy. Uh, there is a cost to being able to do that when you think of the, those types of um, progress monitoring assessments as, as we move through. Yet uh, the big account accountability yardstick is state assessment or how you've done on the ACT. Um, so I think that your question was effective. Um, there's effective instructionally, and then there's effective for other ways in which we're, we're going to, to try to measure and, and categorize. Anyone else? Okay. Um, all right. What can be done locally to affect our education legislation in Wichita, Sedgwick County, and Kansas? And then what legislation might be coming up in 2016 that we want to pay particular attention to? I'd like each of you to address this actually. What can people do if they want to you know, make their voices heard? Oh, 
Um, okay, I'll, I'll start and we can, we can go down the table. Um, what, what can we do first? First and foremost, you have to be informed. Um, if you're relying on your information coming from um, a, a nice postcard in your mail right before election time, we're all in trouble. Uh, that's, it's too late, uh, particularly around education. There's, there's a lot of information out there, some good, some bad, um, some intentionally biased, and uh, I think we, we have to be an informed electorate. We have to ask questions and, and do our research. Then we have to ask the candidates very pointed questions about that. Where do you stand? What do you, what do you believe? And not allowed uh, placards and, um, you know, catchphrases, you know, I want more money into the, into the classroom to, uh, to be the only answer that, we, that, that you get. Um, I think once we do that and as a community we say education is important, um, it is a, a fundamental aspect of our state constitution. Uh, where do you stand? Then you can make up your mind depending on, on your beliefs. Um, as was said earlier, our turnout in elections is pathetic, um, particularly in Kansas around the primaries. Um, and can, can you tell I was a social studies <laughs> science teacher there? Around the primaries is, um, in some cases, has been 10%. And that in Kansas typically is the deciding factor for the election. Um, so those primaries that most po folks set out are really key to who then do we have in, in the general election to, to make those decisions. Legislation, we've seen a number of, of uh, different bills um, proposed in the past, um, and I think we'll see some of those resurface this year. Um, the, the one in reference to special education was Kansas is a, is a state that includes gifted education as part of their, their special ed umbrella. Um, not very many states do that, and the effort was to remove that from the special ed designation. Uh, that bill was pulled today, but it's one that, that services. We've seen um, continue attempts to e erode uh, teachers' rights. Um, a bill that's made it out of committee uh, would allow a local prosecutor to prosecute teachers for using materials that someone considers offensive. Now, if we go around here and everybody describe what that might mean, that could mean different things. Um, so the, the intrusion into education, which is a, a locally controlled aspect in our state at the state level, um, is something we've seen over the last few years and, and I think will continue. The question around school finances is going to be significant. Um, it's an election year. From what we hear, they really don't want to touch school finance, um, get through the election, and then talk about it. So it means for schools, the block grant, which was supposed to be a, a let's hold, gives the state an idea to know what they're spending since it's 52% it's of the budget, um, and we'll get this fixed. Uh, we'll probably be looking at three years now. Um, before we, we see anything there. So it's, there's a wide assortment of, of bills um, that continue to pop up. What makes it challenging for those of us that, that really follow those, they're not typically or lately have necessarily been coming through education committees. They're coming out of all sorts of various committees and they will come very quickly. Um, and if there is a hearing, uh, there's very limited time and there's very little notice. The block grant, for example, was announced on a Thursday. By Friday at noon, you had to sign up. They limited it to about an hour, um, and then it was passed. So even being engaged citizens around that process has become much more difficult to, um, to, to provide input and to talk to your legislature uh, uh, about that. Um, with the State School Boards Association and other aspects, just trying to keep track of those is next to impossible when you're focused on it and, and tapping into. As a general citizen, it, they've, they've eliminated that, and that, that really is something that has, has to change because it's too important. It's something that impacts all of us, and um, the people need to be engaged in, in those conversations and not have it a, a done deal by the time they even realize what's, what's happening.
what he said. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I would add, and I spend quite a bit of time uh, talking with legislators on school finance issues, and, and we're actually having more conversations this year than we've ever had. So on, on one side, uh, I, I, I get real frustrated with, with what happens, as Mr. Allison indicated too, but, but on the other side, I have to also say that we are starting to have uh, an ear. And, but for that to continue, uh, we need help uh, from our, the electorate uh, to ask questions, to stay informed, to understand what's happening. And, and your opinion matters to them because you vote. And, and so it's one of those things where if you don't know what's going on, want to know something about Bill and you can't get an answer from them, shoot us an email or something. And if it has to do with, with schools and education, uh, we probably are watching it pretty closely. Um, Wichita has a lot of influence uh, at the legislative level, uh, but sometimes we do not uh, leverage that like we need to. So just the fact that somebody was able to quote a house bill number here was, I was impressed. Uh, you know, but, but it's that, that kind of, of interest and engagement and, and paying attention to what, what happens. Uh, and it's, we're educators. And, and so if you want to learn something about what's going on uh, and, and can't get what you need from, from our rep elected representatives, uh, let us know and we'll try and, and track it down for you. I, I have the feeling I'm speaking to the choir here <laughs> because you wouldn't be here if you weren't uh, concerned about public education. Uh, but uh, my, my uh, 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 urging is for you to get uh, involved in the political process, find out where the candidates stand. If we keep doing what's, what we've been doing as an electorate in the last several elections, uh, Kansas will continue to be in uh, critical condition when it comes to funding public education. I would echo those sentiments as well and um, just, you know, caution you about when you hear anecdotal information and those outlier statistics um, that are dra dramatized um, to, to impact policy decisions, you know, that's what scares me. It's all of you um, need to be informed and as a public institution, our information is reported, it's on our website, it's reported. Uh, we are required by the federal government to really be accountable for the dollars that we spend and are given. And so um, that's where our accountability lies in terms of reporting back. And so for you, in terms of being informed, it's going out there. The Department of Education has all of this information and the data that we give back to them, um, the Wichita State website has information uh, on our um, research website. And so a lot of information is out there, but it takes time to dig through it, um, to really look and be informed. And so um, that's what I would encourage you to do. 